All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Wonderful to see you on Zoom. And again, I so wish I could be there with you all in person, but I'm delighted to be able to share with you a topic on recent advances in HIV management. Before I start, I wanted to acknowledge that this is quite a large topic and quite a broad topic. And what I was hoping to do in my brief time talking about this with all of you is to hit on points that will be helpful for all of us who are internal medicine physicians, even if we are not HIV specialists or are not infectious disease specialists. And with that, I wanted to move on and indicate I have no financial relationships to disclose and no conflicts of interest related to this talk. And several of the learning objectives will be to have a better understanding of HIV and particularly the epidemiology as it relates to India, and also to discuss HIV prevention and diagnosis, as well as HIV treatment. Again, with the anchoring of all of this towards what the general internal medicine physician may need to know. And ultimately, as currently HIV is in fact a chronic disease, how to manage HIV and patients who are living with HIV. So let me first start by giving a little bit of epidemiologic background. So India does in fact have quite a number of people who are living with HIV. And from this data that I accessed from an online resource, there's upwards of 2.4 million people in India who may be living with HIV. However, I wanted to put that in context. Although India is one of the uh, most populated countries to have such a high burden of HIV disease, in terms of the actual prevalence of HIV relative to other countries, it's fairly low. And in fact, out of the top 140 countries or so that have high number of HIV, India is approximately 90th. And its prevalence of HIV is approximately um, 0.2%. So it's in a large country such as yourselves, it is still a large burden of HIV infection, but it is not as common as it might be in some countries where, for example, um, South Africa has a prevalence of greater than 17% of its population having HIV. One other point to mention is that there's still a substantial amount of new infections that are happening. And there's also, unfortunately, a significant number of deaths related to HIV. There is also, fortunately, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, a good number of people living with HIV on antiretrovirals, but not quite at the level that we would all like that to be. So here's some more information. And I put this in a pictorial representation to show that somewhere on order of 2.3 or 2.4 million people currently in India are living with HIV. And women make up a little less than half of that with about 1 million. Um, and you, as you can see here, the numbers are a little different than the previous slide, but there's still a substantial number of new infections and unfortunately deaths still occurring. Now, what's interesting about the epidemiology of HIV in India is that out of the percentage of new infections, approximately two thirds of those are occurring only in 10 different states as outlined here on the left. And more than three quarters of the people living with HIV in India also are limited to these 10 states here. So while there's a large number and a significant burden of HIV illness in India, it is concentrated in a smaller number of states. This epidemiologic graph also shows that the majority of the states in India are actually showing a decrease in HIV new infections over the past decade from 2010 to 2019, with the exception of several states here. Now, this particular graph is important to note that the vast majority of the route of transmission of HIV in India occurs through heterosexual transmission. There are other modes of transmission, but as you can see, those are much less proportionally important in terms of the route of transmission. There's some percentage of injection drug use, 
some percentage through blood and blood products and other sexual transmission that is not heterosexual is noted and also some perinatal transmission, but the vast majority of cases of HIV arising in India do occur through heterosexual transmission. Now this particular graph I show to highlight what you see here in the green is the number of people with HIV who are on antiretroviral therapy. And at the very top is the graph, the line graph showing how many people living with HIV. The numbers are a little blurred on the graph, but really the takeaway message is there is still a gap, a gap between what we would like to see, which is approximately 90 to 95% of the people who are living with HIV actually being placed on antiretroviral therapy. And in fact, the World Health Organization has a goal of 90-90-90, which is 90% of the people with HIV being diagnosed, 90% of those who are diagnosed with HIV getting antiretroviral therapy, and 90% of HIV being um, undetectable. So we have a little bit of a gap to go in India, although the really a positive attribute here is that you see a steady, continued incline in the number of people living with HIV who are on antiretroviral therapy. Now, for those who are not HIV specialists, I don't want this very busy table to get you worried. I'm going to be speaking in broad strokes about what you need to know regarding HIV treatment. But before talking about treatment, I wanted to actually speak to you about HIV prevention. And in the red arrows here are three different drugs that currently in the United States and in, in the global HIV community are available for anti-HIV um, anti prevention or otherwise known as pre-exposure prophylaxis. I will add from this table, this is pointing to carbotegravir, which is an integrase strand inhibitor, but it is the injectable form which is used for HIV prevention. And the other two medications that are currently utilized for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis are Truvada and Descovy, as noted here. So let me talk a little bit about HIV prevention. And what we currently have are most typically oral medications, uh, the Truvada as noted here, and also the Descovy as noted, which are utilized to prevent HIV infection. Due to time, I won't be going into very much detail about the studies that supported this, but suffice to say that both of these treatments are actually very effective in prevention of HIV. Particular related to Truvada, it is um, available to use most commonly in a daily medication regimen. There are less approved regimens such as on-demand HIV prevention, but by and large, the most common approach is for a daily pill to be taken to prevent HIV infection. One thing to note, though, is that although this medication is good at preventing HIV in sexual transmission and also um, in other forms of transmission, there is no effect in this medication in preventing other sexually transmitted infections. So that is something as a general internal medicine physician we need to be aware of so that when we are counseling our patients, we also counsel them that while this may be preventing HIV, it has no effect on preventing other infections that often transmit along with HIV. Now in terms of the next medication, which is the Descovy, this is fairly similar to Truvada with the note that the Descovy actually has a slightly different type of tenofovir formulation, this one being tenofovir alafenamide, and this tenofovir is much less toxic to the kidney and causes less in the way of longer-term bone toxicity. Similar to the previous HIV prevention medication though, this is also similarly taken by mouth once a day and most typically on a daily basis. The other thing to note though, what is different about this medication currently is while Truvada is um, accessible and available for both heterosexual and um, 
transmission from men who have sex with men. For Descovy, currently at this time, it is really only available for the latter, and the studies have not supported its broadened use for um, heterosexual vaginal sexual transmission. Now, this is a slide I wanted to put up, adapted from our ACP journal, Annals of Internal Medicine, to show that for those of us as internal medicine physicians, if we are going to be managing our patients to try and prevent HIV through the utilization of HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, there is a cadence to which certain laboratories should be checked and also a cadence to which we should be seeing our patients who are on these medications. I won't go through this in a lot of detail, but just to say that at the initial visit of seeing somebody who is on one of the oral pre-exposure prophylaxis medications, these laboratories should be obtained. And then at every three to six to nine months, and on every three month basis, I should say, there are certain tests that should be checked. And what you see here is the categories of the risk factor for HIV transmission, which shows which tests should be utilized at those cadences. And so MSM, just to walk you through some of the abbreviations, is for patients who are um, HIV um, pre-exposure prophylaxis receiving, who are men who have sex with men. TGW are transgender women. And PWID are people who inject drugs. And you can see that currently, the way we practice this, we see our patients every three months, and we make sure that we are checking HIV and confirming negative results before we continue because the Truvada or the Descovy alone would be insufficient for actual HIV treatment. Now, what about a new recent advance in pre-exposure prophylaxis? We do have now a longer acting carbotegravir, which is utilized in an injectable form as pre-exposure prophylaxis. And this was most um, effectively demonstrated in the study that is referenced here from the New England Journal of Medicine, which was fairly recently published. And based on largely the strength of this data, carbotegravir long-acting injectable is now also available for use as pre-exposure prophylaxis. A couple caveats there, though, is that it is limited to uh, individuals of a certain weight. They need to weigh at least 35 kilograms, and it is um, available currently in at-risk adults and adolescents for use. Similar to the chart I adapted from Annals of Internal Medicine for oral pre-exposure prophylaxis, I wanted to indicate that there are similar labs that will also be obtained at a cadence that will be dictated by approximately every two to three months for the injectable pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about HIV testing. And this may be something that is familiar to many of you, but this is the time course of when certain tests will potentially turn positive with the onset of HIV infection. So what you see here at the bottom, though, in the legend is which type of testing would start to turn positive depending on the time frame from the onset of infection. And importantly, the earliest detection of HIV can be accomplished through nucleic acid amplification testing or uh, viral load testing soon after um, a combination antigen and antibody testing can then also help confirm a diagnosis. And further down and much less early in the time course, strictly antibody testing can confirm HIV testing and Western blot. Now, what I will add is that we typically don't use Western blot anymore. And here is, again, adapted from annals, the current testing schema that we often use. And so initially, with a fourth generation HIV immunoassay, which is a combination of antigen and antibody, that is typically what we use. And just to go back and show you, that actually can detect HIV still fairly early within the first um, one and a half to two weeks. So depending on whether that is non-reactive, if it's non-reactive, the testing stops there. 
if that initial test is reactive, then there's a differentiation immunoassay, which helps to di differentiate whether it is HIV-1 or HIV-2. And then further, if it is um, either negative on this differentiation immunoassay or if it's indeterminate, at that point, then the next step that will be triggered for testing would be the direct viral load. So going back to this schema, emphasizing here that currently at this juncture, we don't use Western blot and the typical scheme for HIV testing for diagnosis is in fact a fourth generation assay that utilizes the early peaking of the antigen in addition to testing for antibody. If there is suspicion that even that early window might be missed, then the best test to try and diagnose HIV is in fact the a molecular test for a viral load, which can detect HIV as um, early as within about a week and a half to two weeks. So back to treatment now. Again, I had reiterated that the focus of the talk today is not to have us know every single medication in detail, because truly there are so many of them. At this juncture, there is nearly 40 different antiretroviral HIV treating medications but the general principles is what you want to keep in mind. I will add, there are at least approximately 10 medications which are HIV medications, but we hardly ever use and practice anymore, largely due to some of the significant toxicities and newer agents that have better um, ease of administration and a much less toxic side effect profile. So one thing to take away though is with recent data, including a trial called the SMART trial, the goal is to start treating HIV as soon as possible and as early as possible. There was a lot of um, thinking in the past that maybe one can be observed with untreated HIV infection, particularly if the patient is asymptomatic and not having a significant decline in CD4 count, but we now have better understanding that there's little benefit to waiting and there's much to be gained in preventing the, um, the decline of the immune system by starting antiretroviral treatment as early as possible. And the drugs that you see here are almost all oral medications. There are a couple um, injectable medications, including the carbotegravir that is co-formulated with rilpivirine, known as Carbonuva, which is an injectable medication and also another uh, medication that you see here. And I will add that uh, Carbonuva in particular is becoming more commonly used in most of the initial or early regimens. So what about the general takeaways that we need to know as internal medicine physicians who are not HIV specialists? So first I will add that before starting or contemplating starting any, any HIV medications, certain labs ought to be obtained in your patients, including some baseline safety labs, hemogram, uh, hemogram uh, kidney function, checking a urinalysis, also potentially checking other labs that are metabolic labs that we would screen for. But the goal, again, is start as early as you can. There are certain tests, though, one should definitely check depending on which antiretroviral treatment you decide to pursue, one test that ought to be checked is if you're contemplating a Bacavir as part of an HIV treatment regimen to make sure that you check HLA B5701 because those who have that particular um, genetic confirmation will have significant risk of hypersensitivity to a Bacavir. So back to this guidance, which is from the most up-to-date clinical guidelines for HIV treatment in adults. The main goal is assuming that people who have HIV have not had HIV breakthrough on previous carbotegravir as pre-exposure prophylaxis. The current general guidelines are to consider an initial HIV regimen with the integrase inhibitor Tegravir co-formulated with a nucleotide um, analog, the tenofovir, along with a nucleoside analog, emtricitabine or FTC. 
Similarly, you could also use a different integrase inhibitor, dolutegravir, and you can use a different nucleoside, abacavir, along with 3TC. So general principle for an initial regimen on someone who has newly diagnosed with HIV after getting safety labs, one also should make sure to get genotype testing and assume the, assuming the genotype testing does not show any sort of unusual resistance patterns, the goal is combination therapy always and typically utilizing two nucleoside or nucleotide as tenofovir is a nucleotide along with a third agent that can be from one of these other classes of antiretrovirals, namely either um, integrase inhibitor or protease inhibitor or co-receptor inhibitors. So these are the specific regimens that are recommended currently based on that guiding principle. The one exception of using three treatment medications is a combination of dolutegravir and 3TC, which is potentially a recommended treatment with only two drugs unless the patient is newly diagnosed with a very high viral load or has genotype resistance or has hep B infection. And hepatitis B infection itself can have resistance develop. So in a fairly common scenario where HIV infected individuals are also co-infected with hepatitis B, one would want to make sure that there's at least two agents. So in this case, 3TC has hepatitis B activity, but that's not enough. And you would need combination therapy with this medication and at least one other. And one of those other medications could in fact be either the older version of tenofovir or the newer version of tenofovir. So in those more unusual circumstances where there might be breakthrough HIV infection, in somebody who previously had been using pre-exposure prophylaxis with the long-acting carbotegravir, then there is an alternative regimen that is recommended. Again, two nucleosides, either FTC or 3TC, or a version of tenofovir. But in this case, the third medication would not in fact be the integrase inhibitor and it would be a protease inhibitor. So those are some general principles of HIV treatment. What I will add, though, is certain situations you will want to actually refer your HIV-infected patients if you diagnose them as new infection in the case where they may have a very resistant genotype initial profile or if they may present with HIV infection along with a co-infection, like, for example, tuberculosis, or if they have an opportunistic infection with which they present, or ultimately if you feel because of comfort level, potential drug-drug interaction issues, or potentially um, side effect profile issues that you're not comfortable coming up with an initial regimen, by all means, then please do refer your patients to HIV specialists or infectious diseases specialists. So in my last portion of the talk, I wanted to talk about how you as an internal medicine physician, even if you are not an HIV specialist or an ID specialist, can help manage your chronically infected HIV patient. Because as I alluded to at the outset of my talk, we are really blessed at this juncture in our house of medicine to have enough treatment options that with good adherence to these medications, our patients living with HIV can likely achieve undetectable viral loads and not succumb to opportunistic infection or to significant decline in immune function. I'm old enough to have been around and practiced taking care of HIV patients when that wasn't the case. And really at that point, 20 to 25 years ago, an HIV diagnosis almost was a death sentence. Fortunately, we have come a very long way. And now in fact, HIV is viewed much like the management of chronic heart disease, or diabetes or hypertension as a chronic illness that can be managed. So with that, our role as internal medicine physicians taking care of our chronically infected HIV patients largely follows the model of what we're all good at doing as internal medicine physicians, which is managing our chronic illnesses. So one aspect of that is recognizing certain vaccinations that should be administered to our patients who have 
chronic HIV infection. And I've spotlighted in this immunization chart in the red box, which are the vaccinations that really can be or should be administered to those with chronic HIV and ones that we should avoid. The key takeaway here is that the red colored vaccinations are those that are live attenuated vaccinations. And for most HIV infected patients, we would want to avoid those. Now there are some special circumstances where if there was a significant need to vaccinate an HIV patient who is fairly or significantly immune reconstituted and has undetectable viral load, there may be the indication to vaccinate with some of these vaccinations, but certainly anybody who has advanced HIV or low CD4 count HIV as evidenced in the second, um, or I should say the left-hand half of the box, those patients specifically would not even be eligible for things like MMR or varicella vaccination and absolutely no indication for live attenuated influenza in anybody who has HIV infection, regardless of their immune status. Now, um, managing HIV infection in, in our chronically HIV infected individuals is almost its own talk in and of itself that could last an hour, but due to time, I will summarize very briefly here for what we as internal medicine physicians ought to be doing for our chronically HIV infected patients. One of which is we definitely want to be screening for various co-infections. Certain parts of Asia, and that is inclusive of India, there's a fairly high prevalence of tuberculosis. So for our HIV infected individuals, we absolutely want to be sure that we are screening for latent tuberculosis. And especially in parts of the world, such as in India, where there may be BCG vaccination, we specifically would want to be checking for latent TB through um, interferon gamma release assays or IGRAs, such as uh, TB T-spot or quantiferon. And hepatitis A infection is important to screen for because in certain populations of HIV infected individuals, particularly men who have sex with men, HIV and hepatitis A are often seen together. And it's also a vaccine preventable illness. So if the screening is negative, it can easily be prevented. Other screenings that should be undertaken in our HIV infected patients include testing for chronic hepatitis infections, particularly hepatitis B and C. And of note, um, hepatitis C now is curable with direct acting antiretroviral medications. Hepatitis B unfortunately is not curable, but there is a vaccine to prevent hepatitis B. So again, similar to hep A, if it's checked for and discovered that the person is uninfected, they would wanna be vaccinated. And remember that hepatitis B is also very prevalent in Asia and in Africa, and it is a cancer-causing virus. So vaccinating our uninfected patients who don't have hepatitis B will prevent hepatocellular carcinoma. Other infections that are sexually transmitted also need to be screened. And I will also add for any of our patients for whom vaginal sexual transmission is the main mode of HIV infection. At initial outtake, tr trichomonas should be screened and then to be determined at some future cadence as needed. Now, there are some cancers that we want to screen for, cervical cancer certainly, and also breast, colon, prostate, and lung cancers, much like more standard ways to screen. But I will add anal cancer is something that is particular to the domain of our chronically HIV and infected patients. There in, in the U.S. is not any one national standard for anal cancer screening, but various guidelines, including that from our Infectious Disease Society of America, do recommend in our HIV-infected individuals who have exposure to receptive anal intercourse or genital warts or have dysplasia on cervical cancer testing should also be screened for anal cancer with anal pap screening. And then other chronic diseases, as I alluded to, HIV now, we get to the point where our patients are living with HIV and not dying from HIV. So other chronic conditions as our HIV infected population ages, we'll start to see more cancer, um, pardon me, more chronic conditions that are not HIV. So we would absolutely want to screen for diabetes, dyslipidemia, chronic kidney disease, and I will add, there is literature that suggests 
and now guidance that recommends screening for diabetes, particularly in our HIV-infected patients who are on antiretrovirals, are best done by a fasting blood sugar because there's literature to suggest that the hemoglobin A1C is not accurate, particularly in our patients who are on antiretroviral treatment. And I earlier had alluded to the importance of this particular HLA B5701 testing, particularly in thinking about whether to start a Bacavir as part of the initial regimen, and also consider screening for G6PD deficiency, especially if certain medications such as Dapsone um, or sulfonamides are going to be um, used. The next two slides I'll mention really quickly related to chronic HIV and, of course, COVID-19, the current pandemic we are all facing. Now, one thing I will add is at this juncture, there is no evidence to suggest that COVID-19 and HIV necessarily cause worsening COVID-19 infection. But it is important to note that even well-controlled HIV, those patients are technically immunocompromised. That being said, current guidance, at least in the U.S. based on the CDC, suggests that our well-suppressed, um, well-virally suppressed HIV patients who have immune reconstituted may not necessarily need an extra dose of primary COVID-19 vaccination, but they would have a need for that third or extra dose of, of COVID-19 mRNA primary vaccination if, in fact, they are less immune reconstituted or are immune suppressed due to HIV that is not well controlled and not virally suppressed. And then certainly in the U.S., as well as in other parts of the world, monkeypox had really been rearing its head and making a significant impact on patients. Those numbers have started to die down in the U.S., but I will add for those who are HIV infected, there may be more severe presentations of monkeypox and certainly those um, HIV infected individuals, if they have not been infected with monkeypox, would be eligible to get monkeypox vaccine, which is not that plentiful in the U.S. currently and would also um, have the potential for potentially more severe monkeypox if they are infected. So they would absolutely have an indication for receiving the monkeypox vaccine. So in closing, we have um, HIV is, is diagnosed and we need that diagnosis before we can even manage HIV. In the US, it is considered a routine screening test. So adults up to age 64, should get a routine screen at least once in their lifetime. And those guidelines may not be quite as codified in India, but um, betting, better understanding, particularly the epidemiology of HIV infection in India, will likely lead to the awareness that, it, particularly in certain states in India or in certain patients who may have higher risk of transmission, absolutely checking HIV and thinking about it will be important and particularly in those with higher risk. Preventing HIV is incredibly important right now, and HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, as well as other older tried and true measures, barrier protection, condoms, um, as well as um, other measures that will prevent the transmission of HIV will be continuing to be important. Due to time, I didn't speak a lot about post-exposure prophylaxis, but a drug regimen for those who may have either occupational or non-occupational HIV exposure is also a way to prevent HIV infection. The takeaway for all of you for treating HIV, we start early, as early as we can. There is no need to wait and watch and monitor someone for untreated HIV. And for any special situations or complex drug management, please feel free to refer your patient with HIV to an HIV specialist. And finally, recognizing HIV is a chronic treatable condition. And so that is what we do. We are internal medicine physicians, ACP members, and we know how to manage chronic disease. So we can tap into those skills to flex our ability to manage our chronically HIV and infected patients with all of our usual expertise, not just in HIV itself in terms of its management and follow-up, but also in managing its other comorbid conditions that we see in our HIV-infected patients. And with that, I'm going to conclude and just say a word of thank you 